bunch of know it. Fifteen ish slides left for fifteen ish minutes. How do we study clinical exercise physiology? And this can be applied to anything exercise physiology, physiology, biology, chemistry. How do we study these? And it's a brief review of research methods. So we know a lot about how ex exercise impacts disease from, first of all, case studies, the brave few who didn't know how exercise would impact their condition that signed up for a case study, epidemiological studies, which are on a large population scale, and we're broadening our understanding of cause and effect with clinical or intervention studies. So a brief recap of each of these types of studies and uh, an introduction to one of the first um, observations of how exercise impacts disease. And this was the Hellerstein case study that I mentioned earlier in rehabilitating uh, patients with, uh, with uh, acute cardiac impairments. So in 1960, it was still not accepted that exercise could be used as a treatment and certainly not as a treatment for people with heart problems. Exercise needs uh, a higher heart rate, your heart to work harder. That's not something that you want for someone with an acute cardiac injury. Um, Hellerstein, for one reason or another, was convinced that the abnormalities that they were seeing on their ECG traces could be improved and that exercise was good for rehabilitation. And his case study saw a remarkable recovery for those few patients um, from their normal uh, treatment of six weeks of absolute bed rest. So to put it in context, absolute bed rest is absolute. They were only thinking of getting these patients to sit up. They were only thinking of getting them to move around and then head to the, the bathroom. Otherwise, it was absolute bed rest. And so the complete opposite end of the spectrum was exercise. It was not even fathom that exercise would be used as a treatment for these individuals. Surgery was still being experimented with, and we didn't have a clear idea of how to best help these individuals recover. So this is the situation at the time that Hellerstein presented exercise as a potential therapy. It was radically different from what anyone else would have thought or suggested at the time. So 1960, we see a few patients with remarkable recovery, and that leads to a more formalized investigation. 254 individuals recruited with coronary heart disease. They exercised at 60 to 70% of their aerobic capacity, so a moderate exercise intensity. But looking at the paper, they describe it as calisthenics, hops, leg exercises, and I can't help but think of it as this old time contraption where um, you move around a little bit and maybe that's for Pilates or who knows what, but you exercise in your suit and you get a sweat on and uh, that's what you consider exercise in the mid 1960s. Regardless, moderate intensity exercise was remarkably effective. Two thirds of the individuals improved their EKG or ECG abnormalities. And this was the primary way to diagnose cardiac function at the time. So coming from a place where absolute bed rest was in, or, uh, invoked, no moving around, no sitting up, hardly any surgery, to moving up sweating at a moderate intensity was a pretty radical shift and a pretty nice benefit for all these individuals. And now you look on Google, you type in cardiac rehabilitation, you see weights, treadmill, recumbent bikes, treadmills, 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 bikes. There's nothing on here that's not exercise. Exercise isn't even in this search term, but everything that shows up is exercise related. So I think we're in the process of a pretty uh, favorable shift in understanding how um, exercise impacts at least heart disease. Now I wanna show you the uh, a few excerpts from the paper. This is the formalized published results of that study. In 1968, Hellerstein writes, man today 
tends to eat too much, smoke too much, and do too little physically. Not a very inclusive statement. People today, men and women today. This is man today tends to do all this stuff, which is not good. And I'm only presenting this to show you how, or to, to contrast our understanding of exercise now versus in the early 60s. He goes on to describe individuals in these studies as being sedentary, lazy, hypokinetic, sloppy, endomesomorphic, and overweight. Endomesomorphic is a really unique word. It means to have a round shape and a person with extreme en uh, endomesomorphy is as close to globular as possible. I looked that up before class today because I didn't really remember what that meant. But you don't get that eloquence in scientific papers these days, so I thought it was nice to show that. But the, the message is still there. Man doesn't, man or woman, men or woman, doesn't do enough to um, prevent these diseases or correct them in, uh, um, in a normal everyday lifestyle. So the message is the same, we need to do more. And I often tell people, they ask me, what do I do for a living? I say, oh, I teach um, exercise science at St. FX. And you can really boil down my job to eat less, do more, but don't tell anyone because then I'll be out of a job. Literally, I could tell everyone and they still wouldn't do it. I'd still have a job. Eat less, do more is hard. So case study takes a few individuals and you can see the momentum build. A larger sample, more of an effect observed and then published formally herein. So we get a better idea for how uh, exercise impacts heart disease. Now we can also study a large swath of the population. And this is what epidemiological studies try to do. They take a large section of the population and try to identify relationships between a disease and a factor of interest. So for us, it might be exercise and whatever disease you're concerned with. If you can get an accurate assessment of exercise habits in this large population, and you can assess their, um, the incidence of their disease, you might be able to say, well, people that exercise more tend to have more or less of this disease characteristic. It's a lot of work though. We can do, uh, we can frame this study in a couple different ways. So let's consider all these individuals, they're in a stadium in the sun, and maybe I wanna know um, about sun exposure and skin cancer risk. So I'm looking at just these individuals and I wanna know if there's a relationship between sun exposure and skin cancer risk. Well, what I can do to answer the question, okay, well, is there, um, a relationship between sun exposure and skin cancer risk is I can take these individuals, measure how much sun they've been exposed to, measure the incidence of skin cancer, and then I can take their name, address, phone number, and then every year, every five years, follow up with them and do the same measurements again. That's what I'd call a longitudinal study. And I'd look to see how a factor changes with disease incidence over time. So how the incidence of skin cancer um, changes with sun exposure over time. Not, not, a difficult, uh, um, not a difficult scenario to imagine, but in practice, very difficult to conduct a study like this because think of the man or woman power required to follow up with all these individuals regularly over time. What you can do instead that answers a slightly different question is a single point in time cross-section of the population. You might take all of these individuals and separate them into tall people versus short people, or men versus women, or old versus young, or less clothing versus more clothing, that is skin exposure versus um, more skin exposure versus less skin exposure. And then you can look to see, okay, well, based on my arbitrary separation, is there more likely um, a higher incidence of skin cancer in one group versus the other? So I can see, does the disease incident change across ages at one point in time? And you can change this word out for any factor that you decide to um, stratify your population by. So longitudinal following one group over time, prevalence looking at one section of the population, 
And maybe you want to look to see, okay, well, of these individuals that clearly seek out sun exposure, how does their incidence of skin disease compare to individuals that aren't at the football game, that are indoors, that might not have the same habits? So there's always things to consider in doing these epidemiological studies. Um, let me just emphasize, and you know this already, that the answers we get here are relationships. They're correlative. And correlation does not equal causation. You've probably heard that before. If there's a relationship for people that are in the sun more and a higher incidence of skin cancer, then we would take that information, develop a hypothesis, and as unethical as it is, we would say, okay, well, I bet if I were to expose a group of individuals to a large amount of sun, they would develop skin cancer. That's what I bet would happen based on this relationship that I've observed. Now, you'd never get ethical clearance to do that, you can't induce harm in a subject pool. What I'm describing to you is a clinical or an intervention study. We're trying to isolate the cause and effect relationship. Does sun cause skin cancer or are people with skin cancer just somehow drawn to being out in the sun? We don't know that from the epidemiological study. A clinical or an intervention study allows us to control everything except the variable of interest. What I'm describing is a control group and then an intervention group where we modify sun exposure. One group is exposed to more sun than the other. One group is exposed to exercise uh, and, and another is not. We add or we remove learning or a bias effect by randomizing the groups, by blinding the groups. It's inherently difficult to do that with exercise. You aren't, you know if you're exercising or not. So it's, it's almost impossible to remove bias from the equation and maybe that bias is part of the effect maybe the belief that you're exercising and that good should come from it helps the disease regress and that there's certainly evidence for that in psychological um, disease states maybe that's part of the effect and great the placebo effect is still in effect right um, and then we compare responses within the individual by crossing over, having both individuals do both arms of the trial. So uh, we make sure that uh, there is a response with the variable, there is not a response without the variable, and then we can confidently say this causes that. This is where we get our actionable understanding, our actionable knowledge. If you exercise, we know this happens. And hopefully all those things are good. Now, clinical and intervention studies follow this same formula. Where they differ is that a clinical study usually focuses on treatment of disease. So there is a pre-existing condition and you're looking at incidences or of that disease to see, do they reverse over time? Do they change over time? A clinical study looks at the progression of disease where an intervention study doesn't require the, um, the condition to be there already. We look at uh, intervention studies could be not related to disease or they could be in studying the prevention of disease. So we focus mostly on clinical, even though prevention is probably one of the best tenets that we could hope for in, um, in this field. Most people don't use exercise as a preventative tool. They try to use it as a corrective tool. And when you are studying the corrective ability of exercise, you're performing a clinical study or a clinical trial. Make sense? Lastly, physical activity versus exercise. I saw with the head nods earlier on that I don't need to spend a lot of time reading through these bullets and describing the differences to you. But I'm considering in this course physical activity as unstructured movement low intensity, unstructured activity, at a low intensity, a low to moderate uh, percentage of your aerobic capacity. Things like cleaning the house, walking around to and from school, not structured exercise. And so that apparently leads naturally into the definition of exercise, something that is planned and structured 
that has a definition. There is a type. There is a load. There is an intensity. There's a duration. All of these things are planned and they're usually at a relatively higher intensity with the goal of improving fitness. So physical activity, where it's unstructured and low intensity, still provides health benefits, but it might not change fitness. It might not change body composition, but there's still good evidence to say that it helps with the incidence of heart disease or might reduce mortality. There are health benefits of physical activity. Exercise being more structured and at a higher intensity usually will impact fitness, impact body composition, while also providing those health benefits and more. And so visually you can think of exercise as this structured cube. We have intensity, frequency, uh, duration, and mode. And then while this is defined and you can see all the edges and you know the volume of exercise being done, physical activity might be a section of this with um, um, indeterminate frequency or duration that varies, intensity that goes up and down, it's not planned. 